Toscanini, the maestro, revisited. Arturo Toscanini, born a hundred years ago in Italy, died ten years ago in New York. Toscanini, the most fabulous conductor of his time. Many believed him to be not only the greatest conductor of the 20th century, but also the greatest who ever lived. He was a fiery, single-minded man who could go into fiery, single-minded rages. He represented a force of nature, and when he made music, there was something positively elemental about it, something that swept away all inessentials and created a burning focus. Certainly, no conductor exerted such a dominant psychic force over the hundred-plus virtuosos and prima donnas who make up a symphony orchestra. And certainly no conductor so influenced the course of 20th century interpretation. Toscanini, with his power and aristocratic musical mind, with his unparalleled ear and technique, swept away most of the old romantic notions and concentrated on one thing only, the music. The direct translation of the printed note as he thought the composer would have wanted it. Other conductors tried to read beneath or between the notes to get a message from the music. To Toscanini, the notes were enough, and he interpreted them with primal force. I am Harold Schoenberg, music critic of the New York Times. Recently, I spoke with four conductors about Toscanini. Four conductors, four viewpoints. But they all agreed about certain things. Take Toscanini's so-called objectivity. To George Zell, conductor of the Cleveland Orchestra, Toscanini was much more than a time beater. Of course, we must say that he adhered as far as this is possible to the letter of the score much more than his precursors and his contemporaries. That he was a literalist in the trivial sense of the word is, I believe, nonsense. It is not possible for an artist like Toscanini to be a literalist. He was, I would rather say, say I would rather say he was a truth seeker. As one who despised the old romantic way of conducting, Toscanini was primarily interested in shape, in line, in architecture. To Eugene Ormandy, conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Toscanini represented clarity. The magnificent mind of his, that ability of seeing an architecture of music from A to Z and making the orchestra balance, that was one of his, great, one of his many great successes, six, uh, secrets is the word I should say, use. His secret was he was able to balance a score and an orchestra in such a way that everything seemed so clear. None of us realized how, what clarity meant in music until we saw him do it. But that did not mean Toscanini was inflexible, that his way was the only way of doing things. He would give leeway to musicians in whom he had confidence. To Erich Leinsdorf, conductor of the Boston Symphony, Toscanini was even liberal. No, he was a very liberal musician because once he even told me specifically that, well, he told it the following way, he said, I come to an orchestra where I hadn't conducted there before. And uh, somebody has an important solo, oboe, clarinet, and while I conduct, I listen. I said, it's not the way I like it. It's not the way I want it. It's not the way I had conceived it. But the fellow doesn't do it badly. It is musicianly. It makes sense. And his own conviction is behind it. I say nothing. In fact, how Toscanini managed to get the effects he did is a question that simply cannot be answered. Milton Kadams, a conductor of the Seattle Symphony, played under Toscanini as a violist in the NBC Symphony. To Kadams, the secret was perhaps chemical. Quickly, no. Maestro had uh, a chemical, a physical kind of magnetism which was most compelling. And that combined with the fantastic energy and his taste and musical instinct made up the ingredients of what I call the Toscanini genius. That you had to do against your will just what he wanted. As a former cellist, Toscanini had the habit of pressing his left hand against his heart as if trying to squeeze out more tone.
conductors, his physical approach was one of the quietest. He seldom moved his body, and his beat had almost a textbook quality. It was a beat that made music with unprecedented power. Well, is it the technique? He was just a, no, a born great conductor. I mean, his uh, baton was always from here to the end of the baton like one. And he played the cello, he played the violin, he played every instrument with his baton. And it had a meaning from beat to beat. It wasn't just one, two, three, four, etc. It was for bit what happened between one and two, and two and three. That was his tremendous greatness. I've never seen that before. In my opinion, it was deceptively simple. It was the kind of simplicity that includes in its simplicity the very greatest subtlety. And it was serving his purpose perfectly. He couldn't have had any other technique or he wouldn't have accomplished the result. It was something very instinctive. I'm sure that no one had ever taught him how to conduct. As a matter of fact, the one time in all, all of our years of association that in his study he picked up a stick to show me how to do something with no orchestra there, obviously. And he went through three beats and then he got a very peculiar sheepish grin on his face. Isn't this is a stupid thing for a grown man to be doing? The voice you are hearing is Toscanini's voice at rehearsal. Rehearsal. But to Toscanini, there was no difference between a rehearsal and an actual performance. He demanded perfection at both, and, if he did not get it, might go into one of his famous uncontrollable rages. There was a precision of execution simply unknown before him. There was an unflagging ardor, an intensity, and I may here add that this intensity went also through his rehearsals, and perhaps there he was one of the greatest innovators. He was the first conductor I have known who never spared himself in any split second of any rehearsal, and in that he was terribly different from all the contemporary uh, precursors. That one day he was conducting the Dance of the Nymphs of Warheim. Nobody knew what happened. Nobody could tell, none of the listeners, none of the performers. And all of a sudden, he stopped. He got terribly mad. He had this conductor stick and broke it on his knees. He picked another one, broke it again. Still wasn't going to He took the score and tore it in half, threw it down, and he kicked the stand. Still wasn't going to He pulled his dress, the rehearsal dress, off. <laughs> aspect of Toscanini's conducting, discussed by all musicians, was his tempo. Many thought it fast. Sometimes it was, though his tempos always had great musical meaning. But sometimes his conducting sounded fast, even though it really wasn't, because it was so clear. I think that, that his tempo was uniformly dramatic. Of course, I think tempo as an idea in itself is meaningless. You can have a fast tempo and it seems slow, uh, relatively, um, and you can have a slow tempo and it seems very lively because every smallest detail is coming out the right way. And I think with Toscanini it was the way that everything had an enormous inner drive. And that is why everything seemed on the fast side. Toscanini never arbitrarily picked a tempo. First of all, he felt the tempo. He was bored. That was one of his many great qualities. He felt the tempo, the right tempo. It was always the right tempo. All right, he did conduct sometimes faster some of the things that some of the conductors do now or before him. But for instance, the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. He explained it to me time and again why he wanted to have that first movement exactly the way Beethoven wrote it. Each beat to get pam 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 to get the right rhythmic, the rhythmic pattern, that, that, that driving force that Beethoven had in it, and Tony Toscanini was able to carry it through. For so instance, you may agree, you may not agree, but there are certain tempi that were generally or most, mostly taken before Toscanini, and since Toscanini, they simply, I think at least, are not being taken anymore. One example, Allegretto, Beethoven 7. Three Toscanini, approximately. Toscanini discovered that it says Allegretto. Now, this is not an Allegretto, so he played it. Which, of course, 
course, may be a little bit faster than we find convincing. How do you really arrive at the true tempo, the true character of a work? And he put his arm around me, he said, oh, Cara, he said, it depends upon your taste and your instinct. If you have it, you find it. If you don't have it, please don't make music go men's shoes. All this concerns technique, and Toscanini was a great technician. But no musician is great through technique alone. The fact remains that Toscanini changed the course of 20th century conducting. By his insistence on perfection, by his demand that every note be heard, by his objective approach, he swept all traditions away and created one of his own. Many years ago, he was talking about Beethoven's Eroica Symphony. Some say Napoleon, said Toscanini. Some Hitler, some Mussolini. Bah! To me, it is simply Allegro con brio. This kind of determination to conduct music as music influenced every single conductor of the century. The greatness of Toscanini the conductor, to me, was this tremendous conviction he put behind everything. This conviction was so infectious that the people who played with him or sang with him were completely convinced of what they were doing. And of course, when you have an entire large group of people completely convinced what they are doing, you get the audience convinced of what they hear. And this, I think, is the total impact which, 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 which came this way. They are all influenced by him, but we are, some of us admit it or don't. Every conductor is under the great influence of the master, who we all admit was the only one in the world. I find, in thinking back, back uh, of the Toscanini times, his artistic ethics most impressive. The complete humility in the face of the masterworks. And the self-effacing devotion to the task is something that has influenced all of us. And without him, none of us would be the same. Artistic ethics, the master of us all, the only one in the world. As an example of the kind of coiled spring intensity that Toscanini represented, here is the conclusion of the Brahms' first symphony from the broadcast of November 3rd, 1951.
maestro spent the last ten years of his life, his son Walter has brought together an unparalleled collection of everything relating to Toscanini. Books, scores, programs, memorabilia, photographs, clippings, every recording, every broadcast, films. The house facing the Hudson River is a Toscanini museum. Toscanini's three children also have recently purchased the house in Parma, where their father was born, and plan to make it a Toscanini museum, too. All of the music on this program, by the way, was recorded by Walter Toscanini from the original tapes, acetates, and soundtracks. The music room. Beethoven was only 40 years dead when Toscanini was born. Toscanini conducted the Italian premiere of Peleus and Melisande in 1908. His friend Puccini. Toscanini conducted the world premieres of three Puccini operas. Giuseppe Verdi, Toscanini's idol and inspiration. His father, a tailor from Parma, who proudly wore the Garibaldi red shirt and did what he could for the cause of Italian freedom. Age three, but the eyes are already the Toscanini eyes. Age five. Four years later, he entered the conservatory as a cellist. They called him Genio, genius. Toscanini made his debut as a conductor in 1886 at this theater in Rio de Janeiro. He was 18 years old. The upper was Aida, and he filled in for an absent conductor. The following year, he was well enough known to be caricatured as a boy genius in knee pants. 1890, 23 years old, tough, uncompromising. Already he was known as the coming conductor of Italy. 1899, the Pater Familias. This was taken the year after he had become head of La Scala, Italy's most important opera house. His wife, Carla de Martini. They had been married in 1897. 1902, mountain climbing. One of Toscanini's few hobbies. 1906, with Walter, his first child. Toscanini came to the Metropolitan Opera the following year. Around 1910, the greatest conductor and the greatest tenor. 1915, Walter Toscanini is in the Italian army. Toscanini returned to Italy during the war and did his bit by conducting army bands. Toscanini was an internationally famous figure, and the San Francisco Chronicle heartily approved of his war work with the lusty Bravo Toscanini. Toscanini returned to La Scala. He also toured America with his orchestra. 1927. Returning from Europe with his wife and the three children. Toscanini had just taken over the New York Philharmonic. 1930. With Siegfried Wagner, the composer's son. Toscanini was a conductor at the Bayreuth Festival, but refused to conduct in Germany after Hitler took over. Still 1930. That year, he toured Europe with the New York Philharmonic. He left the orchestra for good after the 1935-36 season. He was then 69 years old. Walter's home movies. The boy is Walter's son, Walfredo. The locale is Isolino, Toscanini's summer home in Italy. Young Giancarlo Menotti and young Samuel Barber. Toscanini at Salzburg. He left for good when the Nazis came in. Adolf Busch, the great violinist. When Toscanini relaxed, which he seldom did, it was with his family and close friends. Like a true Italian, he loved to be at the head of his family. adored Pichu, the family dog, though he always pretended to be feuding with her. The eminent Dr. Toscanini, suntan specialist. Christmas at Villa Pauline, 1939. Toscanini
Toscanini had recently taken over the NBC Symphony. General David Sarnoff, board chairman of RCA, recalls the circumstances. In 1937, I tried to induce Maestro Toscanini to return to America and enlisted in this effort the help of the late Samuel Shatsanov. However, the maestro resisted our initial approaches and he appeared determined not to come back. Then we offered to create a radio symphony orchestra especially for Toscanini. He began to show more interest and finally we reached an agreement. I believe that he was principally won over by the opportunity to have his music heard by millions of people who had never before listened to a live symphony orchestra. From 1937 to 1954, Toscanini directed the NBC Symphony Orchestra, and it proved to be the most productive period in his long career. He was 70 when he first raised his baton over the NBC Symphony, and 87 when he retired. And his artistry, his vitality, his dedication to truth and beauty never wavered. The genius of Toscanini gave music its richest endowment. And for radio, millions of people around the world shared in that magnificent gift. Toscanini hated publicity and was not exactly a comic. But once, in 1939, he lent his services to a comedy skit. It was a benefit for the Chatham Square Music School, and many great musicians contributed their services. If you look closely, you will see among them Latimer Horowitz. The orchestra was called Toscanini and his children's orchestra. And if the players expected to have a ball, they had another guest coming. Toscanini rehearsed them to death. Toscanini took the NBC Symphony on a transcontinental tour. Here is Sun Valley at 5 a.m. A.M. And Toscanini is having a champagne breakfast. He was 83 years old, had more energy than anybody around, and was thrilled to be rediscovering America. He even fell into the spirit of certain impromptu concerts. four years before his death. He found every possible excuse to get into this poncho given to him by Lucrezia Bori. He was 86 years old, but could still hop spryly around. Toscanini retired in 1954. Without his orchestra, without his music, he suddenly grew old. Milton Tatum's paid him a visit in 1956. Good morning, Maestro, Kadem said. And Toscanini said, very sadly, do not call me Maestro. I am no longer a Maestro. During 1946 and 47, Robert Hopka made over 1,500 photographs of Toscanini at work. Some were reproduced in Samuel Antek's book, This Was Toscanini. Others are being shown here for the first time.
Finally, the American Israel Cultural Foundation sponsored a Toscanini memorial concert at which there was a reunion of musicians who had played under the maestro. We took the opportunity of bringing some of them together. Henry Haftel, concertmaster of the Israel Philharmonic. Toscanini conducted its first concert in 1936. Frank Miller, first cellist of the NBC Symphony. Joseph Gingold, a violinist with the NBC Symphony. William Primrose, first violist of the NBC Symphony. Leonard Sharo, first bassoonist of the NBC Symphony. Yuri Teplitz, first flutist of the Israel Philharmonic. Seems to be an impression that uh, he was an autocrat, a terrible dictator, a man prone to insane tempers. Some of his tantrums were quite nicely timed, and he, I know once we were doing a Liuccelli, and because he always had the score for the rehearsal, pardon me, <coughs> and he got into a tantrum and he picked up the score. He got, and, uh, the only one in the States at that time. <laughs> <laughs> then he was on to the tantrum. Very careful. <laughs> I think he was he was uh, quite aware of how orchestras react oh, yes. to to situations. I'll never forget the first rehearsal we had with him in 1937. <laughs> A comparative handful of men in the orchestra had ever played with him before, and we'd had several weeks with uh, uh, with Monteux and then with Rajinsky before Toscanini came, and uh, we were filled with all sorts of apprehension and had no idea what to expect. His, his uh, stories about him, of course, we had all heard. And he came in, Some someone, I, I don't recall who, introduced him to us, as if he needed any introduction. And uh, with no preamble, no speech of any kind, he just announced gentlemen who played Brahms. I remember Brahms' first mm -hmm. symphony. We started the first movement, went straight through the symphony, no stops except for between the movements. And that was it. That was the rehearsal. He wanted to get to know us and wanted us to get to know him, in a sense. And that's all. And it was not a letdown, believe me. It was just a, a, a wonderful introduction to this man. I recall that particular rehearsal. I think it was the greatest thrill of my musical life. Oh, uh... I, uh, of course, was geared up to the occasion. But when that downbeat came, I heard the sound of an orchestra like I've never heard in my life. Well, how, he, how did he do it? What, uh, well, a secret? Uh, why, well was, why would his downbeat be so different from anybody else's downbeat? Mr. Schoenberg, it's so hard to describe genius. Uh, I can't any more describe Toscanini's genius than we can uh, describe the genius of a Beethoven more, except that he was a recreative artist. He had uh, a spell over the orchestra. Uh, how did he uh, work with uh, you gentlemen? I think the experience we had with Maestro Toscanini was a, not only a very great one, but in comparison about uh, the rumors we heard about his output, was a very pleasant one. But I think it's one of the greatest heritage uh, Toscanini left, left us it was one word which he used quite often, and it was a word in Italian, and he said, Signore Cantare. And then he used to put his pay on his heart and, and ask us to sing, you know. And then that is maybe the secret why, why most of the orchestras he conducted played so well and really sang it. Cantare, to sing. And Mr. Schoenberg, we've spoken about Toscanini's various musical uh, activities and what made him tick, so to speak, and about his tantrums. <clears throat> so a little is known of the other side of him. If I may have just a moment with you to tell you a story uh, that happened <clears throat> while we were in South America, Mr. Primrose, Mr. Sharrow, and Mr. Miller uh, remember this very well. After we had played in, uh, uh, in Buenos Aires, we had taken the night uh, boat to Montevideo, and it was a miserable trip. And we had arrived there at 6 o'clock in the morning on the 4th of July. And we had to clear customs, and the orchestra was tired, we were to give a concert that night. And suddenly the orchestra manager announced that we were to have a 10 o'clock rehearsal. A rehearsal. We were all astonished. Why? We had a concert to play that evening, the same program that we had played the previous night. However, the rehearsal is a rehearsal. So the entire orchestra congregated at 10 o'clock sharp, Maestro King on the podium. And he said, gentlemen, today is the 4th of July. It is your great national holiday. And we are thousands of miles away from our beloved ones. 
Anjamo, let's play the Star Spangled Banner. Mm -hmm. And with that, he got up and we played the Star Spangled Banner like you've never heard it in your life. It was so rousing. It was, and when he was through with that, there wasn't a man in the orchestra who didn't have tears in their eyes. That's true. Giuseppe Verdi. Toscanini had discussed the Verdi operas with Verdi himself. Having that direct link, and with Toscanini's own genius, it was no wonder that in Verdi he achieved absolute, unchallenged supremacy. Here is a unique historical document. Toscanini conducting the second act of Aida from the performance of March 26, 1949. In this act, the victory of the Egyptian army over the Ethiopians is being celebrated. The act ends with the great chorus, Glory to Egypt. The singers are Giuseppe Valdego, Herb Anelli, Eva Gustafsson, Richard Tucker, Norman Scott, and Dennis Harbour.
Toscanini. 1867. 